July 23, 2007 began as a normal summer day. Dr. Pettit playing golf. 17-year-old Haley was at home. His wife Jennifer and daughter Michaela at the beach. They all planned to meet for dinner. That dinner would be the last time the family would ever be together. Two intruders broke into the Pettit's home through an unlocked door in the dark of night. Dr. Pettit recalled hearing himself cry out in pain, telling the jury he did not know if he was awake or dreaming. The intruder said, quote, if he moves, put a bullet in him. Commissar Jeffsky and Hayes forced Mrs. Hawk Pettit to drive to the bank telling the bank teller her husband and two daughters are being held hostage. Apparently she came into the bank, she tried to get some money out. So one, of the, one of the accounts was in the husband's name, and then she says, well, my kids are at home tied up, so we don't know if they really are, or if she was just trying to get money out of the bank at this point. Nearly 40 minutes have passed since the bank manager called 911. Police are still outside. With the girls upstairs tied to their beds, the suspects used gasoline to douse the home. Screams were heard, and then the house went up in flames. It was a Sunday afternoon on July 23, 2007 in Cheshire, Connecticut. Jennifer and Michaela Pettit were walking the aisles of the grocery store, buying ingredients for a meal Michaela planned to cook for the entire family that evening. Neither mother or daughter realized that as they browsed the supermarket shelves, an anonymous man was watching them and preparing to follow them home. After waiting out the duration of the shopping period, a man named Josh Komisarjewski followed both mom and daughter to their house. Once in their neighborhood, Josh notices the upscale homes in the area and makes note of their specific home address. Josh leaves shortly afterwards and goes home to spend time with his own daughter. After putting his daughter to bed for the night, Josh meets up with a friend and fellow contractor named Stephen Hayes. Josh and Stephen met in 2006 when they shared a room in a halfway house in Hartford, Connecticut in between prison sentences. By the age of 26, Josh had been arrested for 18 home invasions and struggled with crystal meth addiction. Stephen Hayes was a recovering crack addict and seasoned burglar who mainly broke into cars during the day and stole high value items. Although no longer sharing a room at the halfway house, Josh and Stephen both stayed in touch with each other. Neither Josh nor Stephen had steady jobs and they both needed money. Josh reached out to Stephen about burglarizing some luxury homes to make some fast and easy cash. Stephen liked the idea and agreed to come along. For the most part, it had been a typical summer's day for the Pettit family. All was well and normal until later that night. The Pettit family home was settling in for a night of rest. The two girls, Michaela and Haley, headed to bed after watching TV, and Bill, the father, accidentally fell asleep on the couch in the sunroom while his wife Jennifer went upstairs to their bedroom. Bill woke up after a longer than anticipated nap but decided to stay asleep on the couch that night. Meanwhile, having discussed the plan with Josh, Stephen was under the impression that the two of them would burglarize the home, take the family out to the car where they would be tied up, and then burn the house down to destroy any evidence. There was no indication to Stephen's knowledge that anyone would get hurt. Around 3 a.m., Josh and Stephen broke into the Pettit family home. They were armed with a gun and a baseball bat they found lying in a neighbor's yard. When they found Bill sleeping on the couch downstairs, Josh stood over Dr. Pettit's body for 15 or 20 seconds debating whether or not to strike him. He finally hit him on the head multiple times with the bat until he huddled in the corner of the couch. Josh stated that when Dr. Pettit was hit, he let out an unearthly scream. He told Bill not to panic and that they only wanted money. He asked where the safe was in the house, and Bill Pettit replied there wasn't a safe. He asked him who else was in the house, and Dr. Pettit told the intruders his wife Jennifer and two daughters Michaela and Haley were upstairs. Josh and Stephen tied Bill's wrists, then his ankles, leaving him on the couch bound and bleeding. The two men then made their way upstairs where they found Jennifer in her bed with her 11-year-old daughter Michaela by her side. They tied Jennifer's wrists and ankles to the bedpost and put a pillowcase over her head. They then dragged Michaela into her own bedroom and did the same to her, then repeated the process with Haley, the 17-year-old sibling. Both Josh and Stephen falsely reassured Jennifer, the mother, that the girls were going to be fine and that they only wanted money. Making their way downstairs again, Josh and Stephen made a beeline for Bill, who was sitting on the couch bleeding from his head wound. They cut the restraints from his ankle and hands and forced him down the basement at gunpoint. Once in the basement, Bill was tied to a pole, his ankles bound, and he was covered with blankets. Feeling woozy from the initial attack, Bill drifted in and out of consciousness. Josh and Steven set about ransacking the house, but found nothing. The men went back to the mother to find out if there was any hidden cash in the home. She told them there wasn't any cash in the house, but informed them that she had jewelry instead. While they were searching for valuables, Stephen came across a check written in the amount of $40,000. The men told Jennifer if she withdrew $15,000 from the bank, they would not hurt any of them. Both Josh and Stephen decided that when the bank opened in six hours, one of them would take Jennifer and force her to withdraw the $15,000 from their checking account. It had now been two hours or so since the men had intruded the residence, and Josh checks in on the girls, giving them water and bathroom breaks when needed. 
Stephen continues to look through the home for any items of value. Josh would spend the most amount of time with the girls and especially with Michaela, who he referred to as KK. He would talk about music and other random topics as he stated in his confession. Before going to the bank though, Stephen drove to a gas station with two empty plastic canisters he had found at the Pettit home. Once there, he filled the canisters with $10 worth of gas. He then drove back to the Pettit family house, dropped off the gas canisters, and then went back out again, this time with Jennifer by his side while he drove to the bank. Leaving Josh in charge of the residence, residence. Stephen arrives at the bank and tells Jennifer to go withdraw the 15000 from her account. Jennifer complies, but not without inserting her own critical thinking skills to potentially save her family. While at the bank, Jennifer approaches the bank teller, leans in, and passes over a note. The teller glanced at the note and without hesitating, gave the note to the bank manager who ran into her office. Jennifer then inconspicuously tells the bank teller that the men holding her family hostage were, quote, being nice and only wanted money. Jennifer then leaves the bank, making her way back to the car where Stephen was waiting. She gets in and they drive back to the house. As Jennifer was leaving the bank, the bank manager calls 911 at approximately 9.21 a.m. and informed the dispatcher of the situation. You're watching a wife, a mother, in a desperate attempt to save her family. That's Jennifer Hawk Pettit on a bank surveillance video, telling the bank teller her husband and two daughters are being held hostage and she needs to withdraw $15,000 in ransom money. Minutes later, Jennifer Pettit leaves the bank. Police, alerted by the bank manager, were dispatched to surround the house but ordered not to approach it. They say that's normal protocol in a hostage situation. Yes. Uh, apparently, she came into the bank. She tried to get some money out. The, yeah, one, of the, one of the accounts was in the husband's name, and then she says, well, my kids are at home tied up, so we don't know if they really are or if she was just trying to get money out of the bank at this point. Okay. So she, uh, she, she got, the, she the car's at the house, from what I understand. The, the car is at the house. She got $15,000 in cash in three envelopes with $5,000 a piece. They're all strapped. So $15,000 in $50 bills. Shortly after the call was made, police were dispatched to the address in unmarked vehicles, and they proceeded to set up a parameter around the house. They then hid behind trees not far from the property, and this is where the situation gets incredibly frustrating for most readers, as the authorities went about for a very long duration of time setting up the parameter to eventually trap Josh and Steven in the property. Josh assaulted 11-year-old Michaela as she was tied to her bed. He then proceeded to taking explicit pictures of Michaela on his cell phone. When he's finished, he goes downstairs to find Steven and Jennifer had just returned from the bank. Josh begins showing Stephen the pictures he had taken of Michaela and taunts him to do the same to Jennifer. Without hesitation, Stephen pushes Jennifer down onto the living room floor and begins assaulting her, all while the officers are outside forming the parameter on the property. Josh leaves the room and upon his return, he informs Stephen that Bill had escaped from his restraints in the basement. At that point, Stephen completely loses it and looks out the window to see another unmarked police vehicle. He puts his hands around Jennifer's neck and strangles her to death. Many individuals strongly believe that Jennifer and Michaela's attacks could have been prevented if the authorities weren't so fixated on maintaining their anonymity. Meanwhile, having escaped through the bulkhead of the basement, a horribly beaten Bill Pettit stumbled across his yard to his neighbor's driveway. He was bleeding heavily and hardly able to speak. In a burst of adrenaline, the desperate husband and father frees himself from his basement prison. He rolls to a neighbor's driveway, bleeding badly and calling out for help. When his neighbor came out of his house, upon seeing Bill initially, he didn't recognize him as he was almost completely covered in his own blood. Another policeman arrives while Bill can barely speak but tries to communicate and shouts that the girls are still in the house. By now, nearly 40 minutes have passed since the bank manager called 911. Police are still outside. After Stephen kills Jennifer, he begins to pour gasoline over her body and covers as much of the home as possible with the gasoline, including dousing the liquid over Haley and Michaela, who are still tied to their beds with pillowcases over their heads. Investigators say with the girls upstairs tied to their beds, the suspects used gasoline to douse the home. Screams were heard, and then the house went up in flames. Allegedly, Stephen then set the home on fire and the two attempted to flee in the Pettit family's vehicle, but barely make it down the driveway when they crash into a police barrier at the end of the street. They are both detained and arrested immediately. By the time firefighters arrive at the crime scene, flames have engulfed the top floor of the house. Three people were found deceased in the home, 
Jennifer's body was discovered strangled in the living room while Haley and Michaela died of smoke inhalation upstairs. Haley managed to escape her restraints and run onto the landing but was found collapsed at the top of the staircase. Michaela was still tied to her bed when she was discovered at the time of her death. Reports vary as to who lit the match as both men pinned this on one another. Stephen told detectives that after Josh had showed him the pictures he had taken of Michaela and seeing the police car outside the house, he snapped and lost control, prompting him to kill Jennifer with his bare hands. Josh admitted to following Jennifer and Michaela in the grocery store the previous day and then following them home. He said the reason he targeted them was because they looked wealthy and had a nice car. He had no prior contact with the victims and picked them completely at random. He admitted to bludgeoning Bill with a baseball bat and then assaulting Michaela before taking the incriminating pictures on his phone. But when it came to burning the house down with Jennifer and the girl still inside, Josh told detectives that that was all Stephen. Originally, Stephen and Josh agreed to a plea bargain which would give them life in prison without the possibility of parole. When the defense presented the deal to the prosecution, they didn't agree that either men should have this option. Instead, they would pursue the death penalty in both cases. The jury ultimately came to the verdict that both men should be executed. However, in August of 2015, Connecticut abolished the death penalty, meaning the sentences of both men were commuted to life in prison. Stephen Hayes and Joshua Komastarjewski are currently serving life sentences without the possibility of parole. To this day, there are two sides to the story, one from the family and one from the authorities. Bystanders believe the police could have saved Jennifer, Haley, and Michaela had they not spent so much time setting up the parameter outside while they were being assaulted and doused in gasoline. When Bill escaped the basement and was lying in his neighbor's driveway, he saw the police standing by the trees while the house was spontaneously bursting into flames. When Stephen Hayes returns from the bank with Jennifer Hawk Pettit, it is 10 in the morning, nearly seven hours after the intruders broke into the home. Dr. Pettit hears a commotion and cries out. One of the men says, don't worry, it'll all be over in a couple of minutes. That's when Dr. Pettit hears a hissing sound and says, I realized, quote, I had to get out. When set out like this, it makes complete sense that the family and the public believe that the authorities could have done more to save Jennifer and the girls' lives. Another concerning issue is why the authorities never attempted to intercept Stephen and Jennifer after leaving the bank. But according to phone records, police officers arrived at the property before Jennifer and Hayes returned from the bank. Officers were dispatched to the scene within minutes of the call from the bank manager at 9.21 a.m. By 9.57 a.m., flames were already engulfing out the windows of the home. This indicated that the officers had been at the scene for over 20 minutes and merely observed the home during that time. Many questioned why they didn't approach the car and arrest Stephen on the spot, thereby separating him from his accomplice and allowing the authorities a better chance of saving Haley and Michaela. On the flip side, police believe that they were dealing with a hostage situation and therefore do not know how many perpetrators were inside the house nor what weapons they had. Police, alerted by the bank manager, were dispatched to surround the house but ordered not to approach it. They say that's normal protocol in a hostage situation. They were told by higher-ups to not enter the home, not to speak to Stephen as he got out of the car, and not to communicate with anyone else inside the house. Instead, they were instructed to set up the parameter and observe the situation until further instruction. Personally, I feel the situation should have been intercepted by police before Stephen had a chance to drive onto the property. This would eliminate one of the two threats inside of the house and could have potentially made it easier to try to negotiate with Josh. Either method will have a risky outcome, but one is more proactive than the other in my opinion. Stephen was found guilty on 16 of 17 charges and received six consecutive life sentences. Josh was found guilty of all 17 counts and was charged with up to six consecutive life sentences. Bill Pettit remarried and eventually the couple had a son together. Jennifer Pettit was just 48 years old at the time of her murder, while Haley Pettit was 17 years old and Michaela Pettit was just 11 years old at the time of their tragic deaths.